and we're going to get started. So Deborah Aller is our first presenter, and she's going to be talking about um, the basics of using biochar as a soil amendment. So thanks, Debbie. All right, looks good. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mina. Can you hear me and see me all right? Yeah, I can hear you, and I can see you great. Okay, great. Um, and I, I took off the subtitles from my screen, but I hope everyone else can see the subtitles if they do need those or the closed caption as they might be referred to. Um, and I'm just gonna make this lower too. Okay, great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar series. Um, it's really great to see people interested in biochar, um, at least learning about it for the first time or having quite a bit of experience working with it um, from all over the world. Um, people from India, um, Europe, Canada, the US. It's, it's really great to see there's such a big um, biochar cohort um, around the world and people who want to learn more about it. So as Mina said, my name is Deborah Aller. I'm the Agricultural Stewardship Specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Suffolk County. Um, and actually prior to um, coming here to Long Island and to New York, um, I've been working with biochar for about nine years throughout my graduate work. And so today I'm just gonna provide an introduction um, for those in particular who are just learning about biochar for the first time or would like to learn more just about some of the basics of it. So this next 30 minutes is really going to be uh, just an introduction about what biochar is, how we can use it, the potential benefits of it. And then our subsequent presentations throughout the series, um, particularly Tom and Johannes today, and then the one on Thursday, they will go much deeper into some of these issues that I'm presenting at just a very basic level in the next few minutes. So thanks again to Northeast SARE for funding um, our research project and allowing us to have this webinar series for you all and also Cooperative Extension and Cornell. So um, that didn't move. Are my slides moving? Uh, no, Debbie, if you no. click on this, on the slides. Yeah. There we go. Okay, it yeah. moved, sorry. Sorry about that. So to start, for those that are still unsure of what biochar is, I hope you have at least heard of the word, obviously, if you've signed up for it, but what is biochar from the very beginning? Um, from more of a science perspective, biochar is the solid co-product of biomass pyrolysis. So we're thinking, okay, what's biomass and what is pyrolysis here? And pyrolysis is the idea of this thermochemical decomposition um, of biomass or feedstocks is sometimes what we refer to them as under high temperatures in the absence of oxygen or under very limited oxygen conditions. So pyrolysis is a process that differs from combustion, which is something we see with campfire stoves, um, where you get a lot of ash um, and don't, it, it's a different chemical process. So with biochar, we start with something called a feedstock, and I hope you can see my, um, let me see if I can find the arrow. No, I was hoping you can see my, whoops, my um, mouse point. But on the left here, we have a feedstock, and a feedstock is any type of organic matter. Um, we'll learn some of it can be made from manure, can be made from corn stover resistance, residue, rice holes, um, switchgrass, any organic material can be used to create biochar. And biochar is made, like I said, through this process called pyrolysis. And in pyrolysis, we get three co-products. This gas phase, syngas, and this is something that can go to electric electricity production or to the grid for energy production. We get a liquid product, which are our oils and our tars. Um, and these can go to bioasphalt and other bio-based products. And then we get the solid material and this is our biochar. So just a very basic chemistry of what happens in pyrolysis here um, with the creation of biochar is on the left of this uh, reaction, we have our three basic components of any kind of carbon-based material or woody product, the hemicellulose, the cellulose, and the ligamin materials. So when this material undergoes pyrolysis, we get this aromatic carbon-based structure. And what this, what I mean by an aromatic structure is these benzene rings, these all these different rings, 
put together that create something that's very resistant to degradation by microbial activity um, and other things happening, other chemical processes happening in the soil. And then we have these external functional groups, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And these will vary by production, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. So you won't have to look at any other chemistry um, in this presentation. And in a more simplified term of what biochar is, it's really a charcoal-like material. And what differs, how biochar differs from other materials is that other char-based materials, is it specifically meant to be used as a soil amendment for some type of environmental or agronomic benefit. And biochar is an extremely carbon-rich product, typically depending on the feedstock used to create that biochar, it's about 50 to 80% carbon. So we're putting carbon directly into the soil to increase um, organic matter. And it's extremely porous. It's a very porous structure. And I'll show some uh, scanning electron microscope images of biochar's internal structure. And you'll see, it really looks like a sponge. And when you hear biochar being able to improve water and um, nutrient retention, it's this sponge-like porosity um, that helps do this for biochar. And biochar is also a very, um, also differs, and because of this pyrolysis process, it's a very recalcitrant material, which simply means it's resistant to degradation once it's applied to the soil or put in for some type of environmental application. And this image on the right here simply um, just shows prior to incorporation, what biochar might look like on the surface, um, surface of a soil. So biochar is really not a new idea, and it's been something that's been happening for thousands and thousands of years, but it was um, first discovered in the central Amazon um, and was a practice by the indigenous Amazonian people in an area of the world that is typical of these oxisol soil types or tropical soils that are typically um, have low fertility, low cation exchange capacity, low soil organic matter, um, you know, relatively low crop yields. They're not the most fertile soils by their natural conditions. But in these areas, this idea of these terra preta soils, which are these oxisols with biochar, um, and this biochar became, came from the campfire residues, they think, ar archaeologists think, um, and they've been deposited in these soils for thousands of years, and they've made soils that are typically not fertile into very fertile soils that have higher crop yields, higher water and nutrient retention, and many other um, improved soil properties. And so they're very dark soils and, and the color of soil, the darker the soil, typically the more organic matter um, and better performing, better functioning the soils are. So this is not a new idea. And similar soils have been found in other parts of the world. And to be honest, they're all over the world. Um, places like Lo Liberia and the, the Midwestern states of the US, there's a large percentage of those soils that have quite a bit of carbon in them. That's been linked back to some type of um, biochar or charcoal, charcoal product in those soils. But in more, more recent times, biochar has really taken off in the news as something that can improve, a product that can improve the soil, improve water retention, sequester carbon, a host of properties um, and a host of benefits here. So these are just, you know, it's, it's becoming more mainstream. A lot more people are interested in biochar and learning about it and the reason why you all might be here today. In addition to just kind of those popular press about biochar, a lot more research has been going into, into biochar and, and what it does, how it reacts in the soil and, and in different environmental settings. So there have been more than a dozen, two dozen books um, out there on biochar for various applications, whether it be engineering applications, garden applications, um, farming applications. So there's a lot more information out there. And the science behind biochar has really progressed um, in the past several decades. So people often, I find in, in my work and just discussions, people really confuse or you know interchange the terms char, charcoal, and biochar. 
So I'm just going to present kind of the differences in how we should talk about or, or might discuss char versus charcoal versus biochar. So char is really any kind of carbonaceous material, natural fires, this is char. Um, and it does leave some type of residue on the soil. And also char might be slash and burn agriculture. Those are examples of, of how char would enter the soil. And charcoal, what is charcoal? Charcoal is really something that is used for cooking or heating. Its intended purpose is a fuel. And often things like charcoal briquettes or, or lump charcoal, it can be treated with some type of flame um, or some flammable product to help ignite it in, in, a, in a barbecue or something else. So that's kind of how modern day charcoal. And then when you think of biochar, think of that word bio, biology. Um, and that's how we're differentiating it as this intention for application to the soil environment. And as the research has advanced around biochar, we've, we've come to, um, Jeffrey Novak and kind of termed the, coined the term several years ago about designer biochars. And this is the whole idea of engineering or producing biochars for specific end uses and specific applications for improving certain properties um, in the environment or in the soil. And this is just a picture of a soil core with biochar that had been amended to the soil. So what are the benefits of it, of biochar? Why, why has there been um, you know, more and more of a craze around biochar and its potential impacts? Well, there are a, a lot of long lasting potential agronomic, environmental and social benefits. And this is just an, a, you know, a widely used images, um, image I'm sure many people have seen about the benefits of biochar, um, both for the soil and the atmosphere. And here I just list some of those out. Um, improvements in crop yields and growth, water quality, capturing things like nitrate and, and other nitrogen runoff in agricultural environments, increased microbial activity in soils. Um, this is big with the whole soil health movement. Um, improvements in, in human health, and this is something particularly for uh, developing nations of um, having cook stoves that might uh, not produce harmful emissions inside homes or other things like that in the climate mitigation aspect of biochar. And that's something Johannes is gonna talk about a little bit um, in about an hour or a little bit later than that. Um, so I'm not gonna spend time on this, but just realize from the climate mitigation side of things, biochar is not just a carbon neutral product, it's actually a carbon negative product and its ability to sequester carbon in the soil. So Johannes will talk about that in much greater depth shortly. So one thing I've really been interested in and is an important aspect of biochar compared to other organic materials is this idea of aging or weathering in the soil environment. So what differs between biochar and other or uncharred organic materials um, and this, what happens from a chemical standpoint in the pyrolysis process is that there's an initial fraction of biochar like any organic material that degrades or breaks down in the soil. However, at some point, this, this, back, this recalcitrant backbone of biochar remains in the soil and stores carbon and builds soil organic matter. So the exact half-life or breakdown of biochar varies um, depending on production conditions and the feedstock. But overall, there is a large fraction of biochar that does remain in the soil. So you don't have to apply biochar annually like you would a compost or a mulch or something like that because you're getting this much more, these longer term benefits from biochar amendments. And this figure on the right here just gives you some idea of kind of carbon from what would be a growing tree when that's planted versus an uncharred labile biomass, organic material, versus a biochar product, that that rate of de degradation is on the order of thousands of years. And what's really great about biochar is its versatility and that it's scalable in many different systems. So in parts of the, the Midwest where we're looking um, at biochar for, for bioenergy production mainly, we have these kind of integrated biochar bio, bioenergy systems that utilize mainly fast paralysis and gasification where two different ways biochar is produced. 
But this type of biochar production typically leads to a larger percentage of oils and gases and a, um, less biochar is produced. And these are largely at higher temperature, shorter resonance time for creating the biochar. So they're, they're more geared to the energy production than the actual solid biochar production. Where on the other side of things, we have typically um, a small, small kiln that can double as a cook stove in some parts of the world. Um, and this biochar is typically produced by slow pyrolysis. Once again, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of these production conditions as they will be discussed in later presentations. But it is slow pyrolysis is well known to produce more of the solid biochar product. And these are typically done at much lower temperatures and for a longer period of time. And as biochar, um, interest in biochar has, has grown, there are a lot of companies that produce biochar and biochar-based products. Here, I've just chosen some, I'm not excluding anyone here, I don't mean to be, um, but just to give you some idea that the number of companies making and uh, selling biochar are growing. There are more than two dozen in the US alone and there are ones um, worldwide as well. And in addition, um, to the, to the company sources of biochar, which, which Tom is gonna to talk a little bit more about in his present, next presentation. Um, you can also produce biochar yourself. There are simple kiln systems um, that can be made that limit oxygen into the system to produce some type of biochar product. Within biochar production, there, there is a lot of diversity associated with it, and the diversity of biochar is a result of that initial feedstock that I mentioned, as well as the production conditions. Is it fast paralysis, slow paralysis, gasification? What is the time it, to make it um, the temperature? All variables that impact the resulting biochar product. And so because the original feedstock that makes biochar and the production conditions vary, biochars are not all the same. So here is just a picture of three different biochars that have been produced from different feedstocks under different production conditions. Thus, they've resulted in three different products. And you can see if you look just down at the bottom, there are different size particles, different shapes, um, and, and therefore their applications might be different. And then we take a, a closer look at things. Um, these are some great pictures from, from Dr. Robert Brown at Iowa State. When we look at the same feedstock, um, in this case a switchgrass material in the top left corner of this image, then we look at what happens after it's undergone fast paralysis, gasification on the bottom right, and slow paralysis on the bottom left. The size of the particles, the shapes of the fragments are all different. So we have the same feed up, feedstock, different production conditions, and this creates slightly different properties. And on, the, and on the right here, we can see different feedstocks, different production conditions. We have different colors, again, sizes, shapes. These can be crushed and manipulated um, to create particles of similar sizes or ground, um, but realize that the properties might not all be the same. So there's inherent diversity in biochar itself. So just briefly, um, the availability of biochar has, has greatly in, increased, um, particularly over the past decade as, as interest um, in it has grown and in our understanding how, of how biochar impacts the soil um, and, and a host of other applications, it, its benefit. Those have improved. We have biochar available at a much greater scale. However, it is still limited at what we would think of a large scale field application. Um, and the costs have changed. The costs have decreased. However, it is still fairly expensive. Um, these are some prices I've, I'm aware of or I've, I've found on, on retailers who sell, on sites of retailers who sell biochar, some just cost estimates. And, and our consistency of producing biochar has improved greatly but there still is variability in the product. And 
it's more the shipping shipping or the freight associated with biochar can be fairly expensive. So you wanna think about sourcing biochar from a local supplier. Um, and also we think about that from a sustainability perspective. We're thinking about reducing our carbon impact here. Um, we don't wanna be shipping carbon thousands of miles then to just try and sequester carbon potentially. And also when we think about feedstocks and producing biochar, we're using, we're not cutting down living trees to produce biochar. We're producing biochar from wastes, organic waste product, trees that would, you know, are dead or dying, um, trees or, or residues that have already been harvested. So these are already organic waste products that we're creating a more valuable product for soil application. And so as their availability of biochar increases, the, the hope is that biochar costs will go down over time. So potential future prices may be in the order of 100 to 200 US dollars, this is per ton, versus what might be about $1,500 at present for, uh, for purchasing biochar. So when I think about the costs associated with biochar at present, as well as um, the diversity of biochar products based on the production conditions, we need to think about what is, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Why, why are we applying biochar? And so thinking about your individual um, setting, are you a farmer looking to improve water and nutrient retention in your field? Are you a landscaper trying to alleviate compaction? Um, are you in you know, maybe a, a policy role or something where a county is looking to improve water quality um, and capture nutrients? So, when you're thinking about purchasing biochar or using biochar, asking the questions of what am I trying to use this for? So I'm, the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna talk about applying biochar um, and, and show some pictures of different ways of applying and incorporating biochar. So currently, as far as I'm aware, there's no standard application rates. Um, people will ask, um, sorry, there's, questions popping up all, all over my screen. Um, but it will vary um, depending on who you're talking to and what your intended application is. But realizing that biochar application, it's, it's very soil crop biochar dependent. There's lots of variable, variables that go into uh, applying biochar. And, and really, again, what is your purpose in applying biochar? There are um, some growing guidelines around safety related to soil applications. Historically, there had been some concerns about PAHs um, or dioxins or other products within biochar. Um, a lot of these have been, um, they're not an issue. However, there are some international biochar initiative guidelines or recommendations, as well as there are some new uh, state within the US potentially local state guidelines in terms of applying biochar for, for food safety or environmental um, issues. Although I said there's no recommended application rates, there are um, some ranges potentially of where we're seeing benefits associated with biochar. And biochar, like, like most products, more is not necessarily better. Um, we are seeing consistent benefits when we think of container applications or large garden areas of maybe a 10% volume basis. Um, and, and that may go up to 20%, um, but we're not talking about supplementing 100%, 50% of their area with biochar, um, either container or field scale. Um, field rates, I've seen consistent benefits. I've, I've converted the higher end of the seven tons per acre into a couple other units hopefully to um, assist our international audience just to give some idea what I've seen benefits from biochar. And like I said, there is evidence that if you apply a lot of biochar and we're talking about at amounts that are not economically viable for, for most people, those can be detrimental. But at a small scale, a lot of these benefits that I have mentioned will be discussed in the, in the next several presentations. Um, it, it has a lot of benefit. And a lot more of the research has gone into um, inoculating biochars with compost teas or worm castings um, 
or co-composting biochar with compost and other organic materials. So you really get this synergistic effect of a more labile organic material like compost and all the microbial inoculants in those with the kind of more recalcitrant, inert backbone of biochar product that creates a home for those microorganisms um, and acts like that slow release fertilizer into the soil. So especially if you're buying biochar at a smaller scale, potentially, um, looking for products or asking someone about, do they inoculate it? Um, are the biochar sites already charged with nutrients? And is that gonna be better for my soil? In terms of when you're applying biochar, um, just some basic PPE um, is recommended because it is a very light material and it can blow away. Um, particle mask, if you can find one these days, um, hopefully you can. Um, just some goggles and gloves are recommended, I would think, when, app when applying it. So here are some pictures of just different methods of incorporating it in a field setting. So if you work in an agricultural environment, um, on the, on the top, just widespread broadcasting and incorporating it through light tillage into the surface. Or um, if you're working potentially in a perennial system, like on the right here, of spreading it by hand and then raking it in. Um, I've also seen, here's some pictures on the left from the International Biochar Initiative of radial trenching and vertical mulching into established tree plantings. Um, and on the right, seen it applied as a liquid biochar product in um, injection and subsurface applications to uh, trees and other perennial plants. There are also this option to kind of top dress or band apply it on the surface. Um, and so you could apply a layer of biochar and then maybe if you would like to put more mulch around a tree base, that's a possibility. So the last thing I really want to touch upon is where to apply biochar. Um, because biochars are not all the same and, and, and there are many associated benefits, where we're seeing um, the impacts of biochar to be the greatest are really degraded soils. If we go back to that example of the history of biochar and it being um, biochar really be, being known by these oxisol soils or these soils that were low um, had low fertility, that's where we're seeing the best, the most benefits nowadays. Sandier soils that have low organic matter and low water and nutrient retention, um, low fertility. So I just pulled up a really, um, what I think is a, is a great study um, from one of my colleagues during, during graduate school. Um, and this is some modeling work. So um, the, this is um, obviously a map of the United States. Um, and what we're seeing here is, um, so in anywhere there's colors where you see greens, yellows, red, this takes the, the USDA NAS cropland da data layer and overlays it in the US. So, so ignore the black areas, that's not technically cropland areas. But what we're seeing here um, in terms of EY, which is the effective yield, the potential yield benefits for crops associated with biochar applications. Anywhere we see um, more red, the chance of biochar having a positive impact on crop yields is lower. Whereas in green, those are the areas of the country where we're potentially seeing more yield or greater crop improvements from biochar um, applications. And this takes into account various biochar properties. It's for biochar that's applied at 15 megagrams per hectare and it is a wood-based biochar. So we can see overall that parts of the, the country where we know are highly productive soils like the mollusols in the U.S. Midwest here in the middle of the map, those are largely red. So we know the potential benefits for, for crop yield are going to be lower than other parts of the country like potentially the southeast or in US where there are um, sandier, lower fertility soils. Um, so I recommend if you want to, to look more and there's some other great maps in that um, paper, check out this reference on the bottom and, and learn more about that study and how they got this information. But taking, going from the larger US picture down to a, a, um, 
a specific highly productive agricultural region in the in the US as well as the world is the Central Valley of California. So this is just a map of um, the state of California. And in the middle here, we see this is really the Central Valley. And on the, um, this is from the same paper, a different figure, so you can see. So here, what they did is they looked at three soil, um, common soil properties that are measured. Soil pH on the left, soil organic matter, and this is this brown figure cation exchange capacity, and then once again, the potential for a positive response on crop yields within the Central Valley. You can see um, on a pH scale what's in red. I hope nobody is colorblind on this uh, red-green colorblind um, watching this webinar, but the lower the pH um, is in red and the higher the pH in, is in blue. And we can see there's kind of an east-west split in areas of the Central Valley that have greater fertility and lower fertility. Typically on the eastern side of the Central Valley, we see lower pH, we see lower um, soil organic matter, and we see lower cations exchange capacity. And then when we take those three soil properties and we look at the potential for a positive yield response in that figure all the way on the right, the darker the green, the probability of having a greater yield response to biochar application versus on the in red, the likelihood of increasing crop yields from biochar applications is lower. So what we can see from this is simply where we have a low pH, soil organic matter and cation exchange capacity, we have greater likelihood of having a positive yield benefit from biochar versus having a high pH, higher soil organic matter, and higher cation exchange capacity levels, the likelihood that biochar is gonna have a real impact on our yield is going to be decreased. So just to summarize before we move on to our next presentation is that biochar has the potential to improve crop yields, um, plant health, and, and water and nutrient retention. And this is particularly true of degraded areas, sandier soils with low fertility. And there's a host of soil property improvements. I didn't go over these, but um, these are really well known. And I'm sure a lot of you on this call today recognize these. There's also the potential to um, improve plant defenses and its ability to um, you know, fight off pathogens or other diseases if impacted after a biochar application. And biochar, it's, it's not a fertilizer, it's a soil amendment, but it has the uh, potential to reduce our fertilizer inputs um, by improving the resiliency of the system and adding organic matter to the soil. And it's another tool for, for growers, um, for farmers, producers, whatever you'd like to call yourself for, um, you know, it's, it's another tool in your, in your management toolbox, as I like to say. And if you, if you grow container crops, um, there's more and more work out there. And, and Mina and I are doing some work ourselves, looking at what percentage of that container, and we're going to talk a little bit about this next week in, in a different session, of it being able to substitute a fraction of uh, container media of non-renewable um, container mixes like peat, uh, for example. And, and there have been a lot of benefits shown with maybe up to 10, 30% um, incorporation of biochar in, in containers there. And this is a great way producing biochar, producing energy, producing a, a you know, recalcitrant organic matter um, for reducing farm waste or just general waste. Um, and there have always been some concerns about biochar, but what it really won't do. Um, biochar is not a silver bullet like any, any tool out there, but it is the ability to imp um, improve a lot of properties and, um, and plant growth. Is the ability or you know, the opportunity to reduce fertilizers and pesticide inputs um, to, to farms, um, to landscapes, as I've already mentioned. And there's, there's really no risk or a very, very low risk of introducing any type of um, 
harmful compounds into the environment or um, into crops. There's really no food safety concerns um, that I read. I, I was reading a recent meta-analysis that these are in such low amounts that there's, there's no risk of, of harm there. And people also ask me if, you know, biochar, is it a pesticide or is it, is it a fertilizer? And it's not a pesticide and it's not a fertilizer either. It's a soil amendment um, for um, various soil property improvements, as I mentioned some of them there. So I'm sure that left many folks with a lot of questions, um, but thank you for, for listening. And, and please, my email is right there. Um, you can ask any questions through that or I'll, I'm happy to answer questions through the chat now. So thank you, Nina, thank you, <laughs> everyone. Yeah, so we've been getting a few questions, Debbie. Um, I just wanted to make some clarifications. Folks um, have been requesting copy of the slides. And so I said, anyone who is interested in getting a copy of the slides from the presenters today to just um, give me their email and chat. Some of you have been doing it in the Q&A and that's fine. Um, so we'll be sure to get that, um, those slides out to you within the next couple of weeks. <laughs> you'll give us that amount of time. Um, and then Debbie, you'll see that some of the questions were upvoted. So I figured you could tackle the ones that were upvoted first. Do you see those? In the Q&A? Yep, in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, and just be sure to read so, the question aloud. Yeah, so the first question here is, can you address the issue of sustainable biochar? Is life cycle analysis needed to assure that we do not harvest biomass in unsustainable ways and that all of the energy created in the process is fully utilized? Um, that's a really great question. And I'm, I'm sure Tom, our next speaker, is gonna have some, some comments on this one as well. But really the whole idea behind biochar is we're not um, harvesting, you know, for example, in the US Midwest, corn stover residue goes a lot towards bioenergy production, but there's also the well-known benefits of leaving residue on the soil surface for greater nutrient cycling, obviously building organic matter and other things like this. So the idea is not to use residues that would have other positive benefits or, um, you know, like I said, cutting down living material just for creating biochar. We're talking about creating biochar from organic materials that would otherwise be wasted or um, not be utilized. Um, there's, there's a lot of work um, out West. Again, I know Tom knows a lot more about this than I do of using forest waste products to creating um, a biochar, a sustainable biochar product. So I know there are some more life cycle analysis papers out there um, and there's more research going into that. Um, Tom, do you wanna jump into that question anymore at all or um, you might touch upon that in some of your, your next slides? Yeah, um, I, can, I can talk about it in my presentation. Yep. Okay. Um, the next question, what's exactly the difference between biochar prepared through pyrolysis and through combustion? So when we think about biochar, it's, it's th created through this pyrolysis process. And the difference between combustion and pyrolysis here is, is the oxygen present in the system. So pyrolysis is really the no oxygen or very low oxygen condition. We're not getting an ash product. Um, it's allowing us to have that more recalcitrant product. Um, we're not burning the material fully. Uh, does this type of map, so I'm guessing that modeling um, map exists for Europe. As far as I'm aware, um, it's only been created for the US at the moment. Um, I would uh, recommend contacting um, Hamze Dugohaki, the, the author of that modeling paper directly. Um, if you have questions, um, he may be expanding this to European or other, other countries to get some sort of estimates, but I know that was only based on USDA cropland data layers for creating those maps. But please feel free to reach out to the author for that directly. Do you know of anyone, well, there are a lot of questions coming in, I apologize. Do you know of anyone using biochar to mitigate soil acidification in the US? Um, well, biochar itself, typically the, the pH of the biochar is relatively high um, and it's also often been compared to 
um, agricultural lime as its ability to kind of raise and neutralize pH. Um, so they're, uh, you know, it's normally a, a factor um, or a property that's collected in, in most studies. Um, I'm not sure about directly widespread soil acidification, but it certainly, um, you can think about it as an agricultural lime and its impacts on soil pH. Um, your statement on PAHs, um, so that's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and dioxins is very comforting, except IBI requires testing for it. Are there any credible references that can put the risk of toxicity in perspective? Um, I do have a, a paper I can send you. I know um, Jillian, who's speaking on Thursday, her lab does a lot of the analysis and she probably has recommendations where biochars can be tested specifically for it. Um, I will, when I'm done presenting or answering questions here, I'll try and look for that reference and I can put that into the chat box for everyone to see. Um, but there are labs that do test for it. Um, it is fairly expensive um, for a lot of testing of a lot of parameters, but I'll do my best to try and put some more information in the chat after I am done. Um, Mina, should I keep answering questions? They keep yes. kind of coming in. I, I was just going to come it. on. So I've been keeping track <laughs> of, okay. um, of the time that we have. And um, we've been answering questions for about five minutes. So you have, I, you know, we can go for another five minutes. But I think also what we can do is some of these questions are too technical for me in terms of the biochar. But I feel like once Tom starts presenting, you can answer some of these questions. Um, you can type the answer in and then, you know, Tom can be presenting as well. So. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and, you know, answer a few more and then we'll. Okay. Great. Talk. And, and a lot of these, um, like I said, my presentation was really just an introduction to biochar and discussing very briefly some of the very basic ideas about biochar and things we're still learning about it and an overview of its benefits. A lot of the next presentations are going to dive in, in greater detail to a lot of these. So I, I kind of hesitate to, to answer all of them at the moment. Um, Let's see what else there is. Um, there are growing concerns about biofuel and biomass production, especially regarding the level of energy consumption that is required to produce the resulting biomass, including biochar. What are the figures regarding full energy consumption, including shipping? Um, that, that is a really great question. And I am, I am not fully sure of kind of the life cycle analysis, which was connected to another question there. Um, once again, on Thursday, we're gonna have a, um, someone from the industry who actually works in, in biochar production and his company produces it, um, that might have a much better idea of kind of the energy um, figures in, in various production systems and how those have, they've been able, able to capture more of the energy associated with producing biochar and other products in their production. Um, I can definitely, we'll, we'll share a copy of the slides as well as all the presentations. Um, okay. How can we use biochar in high pH soil? These soils are low in organic matter. Okay, so when we have the issue of low organic matter, but high pH. So there are um, biochars out there that have a lower pH um, or a more neutral pH. Um, I've seen biochars ranging from seven to 12 or even higher on the pH scale. Um, so when you're thinking of, depending on whether you're making biochar yourself or potentially purchasing it, purchasing it, um, when you're purchasing biochar, there should be kind of parameters listed on the bag or the retailer should be able to provide properties of that biochar. So you might just want to make sure you know what that pH of the biochar or that soil organic, soil amendment material um, that you'll be applying what that is. 
Thank you for the webinar. Is there a risk of the biochar hosting and increasing harmful pathogens? Um, that's a really great, great question. Um, I, I have not heard of anything myself. I've done uh, a little bit of research looking at biochar and its ability to suppress um, soybean um, nematode in, in soybean production, and it was able to help reduce the effect of that pathogen. I don't know of any work about increasing pathogens. I've seen a lot more in its ability to suppress pathogens, but someone else may have a comment on that. Uh, well. Debbie, so I'll I think leave Brian, that for further discussion. I think Brian Sales uh, next day, okay. I think he's going to cover some of that in the research that he did with blueberry production. Okay. All right. I think um, we can answer these. Yeah, there's lots of questions, questions coming in. <laughs> so I think between the two of us, we can answer some of these. I've noticed a few that I can tackle. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start tackling some of them if you want to introduce um, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Tom, why don't you go yeah. ahead and start sharing your screen? Yes, Tom, please go ahead. I will stop sharing. So thank you again, everyone. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our, so Mina and myself and anyone um, will keep tackling your questions as Tom presents. Um, he might answer some of these directly, but I'd like to introduce Tom Miles, who's the executive director of the United States Biochar Initiative. And he, um, Tom, if you show your video and please introduce yourself a little further and thanks again for presenting today. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes, yep, yep. see your yep. screen and, and we can see you. Perfect. Okay, good, thank you. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thanks for a great, uh, great presentation, really great uh, introduction and obviously uh, stimulated a lot of questions. Uh, again, my name is Tom Miles. I'm the director of the US Biochar Initiative. I'm an engineering consultant with over 40 years experience in the design and development of biomass energy systems. I've been asked to provide an introduction and over overview of biochar products, uses, technologies, and, and the biochar community. I'll present several images of biochar use. Some will be similar to what Debbie presented. Um, more detailed descriptions of these applications will be presented during this webinar series. So many thanks to Debbie and Mina and the Cornell Cooperative Extension Suffolk County for the opportunity to share our experiences with uh, biochars. So, the U.S. Biochar Initiative. It's a nonprofit association of scientists, engineers, farmers, and biochar producers dedicated to the promotion and use of biochars which are safe, stable, and sustainable. We promote biochars through networking, education, and demonstration. USBI assists in outreach and education, market development, and in the development and demonstration of carbonization systems. We publish a newsletter, a website, and we're on social media. We host an internet discussion list, workshops, and webinars. We enjoy the support of many organizations, including the USDA Forest Service, Agricultural Research Service, Natural Resource Conservation Service, and local and regional organizations and biochar producers. Biochars are delivered, as Debbie described, as carbon and combinations of carbon and minerals and in liquid suspensions. They eventually reside in soil solutions, like the carbon amended clay soils or terra preta, which is shown here being inspected by Dr. Johannes Lehmann on the banks of the Amazon. In terra preta, carbon is mixed with the heavy acidic clay soil and with nutrients from biosolids, food waste, and litter to form a dark productive organic mineral complex. When you handle terra preta, as we did on this trip, you can feel and smell the rich life that you can also see in the diversity of the plants above ground. Today, we call the carbon fraction biochar. Biochars can be supplied in many forms and qualities as large and small chips combined with fiber, densified, granulated, or in liquid suspensions. When wood or biomass is heated, a skeleton of carbon is left as fine-grained, highly porous charcoal that helps soils retain nutrients and water. Their pore sizes and surface areas are suitable for capturing gases and nutrients essential to plant growth. Organisms feed on the nutrients and facilitate transfer to the plants. The low density and porosity of biochars improves water infiltration and water retention, which helps soils to make more water available to plants and extends the growing season, especially in sandy and clay soils. These properties are improved by new methods of processing. 
Among its many functions, scientists have been discovering the value of the electrochemical properties of biochars. Forms of biochar can increase soil redox potential, which results in greater plant nutrient content. It is said that biochars are geo batteries which store energy and nutrients. They help plants and organisms in the microbiome cycle carbon, nutrients, and energy through the soil. So let's see how these geo batteries are produced. Biochars can be produced at scale in existing bioenergy and wood products facilities and delivered in bulk or in bags to farms and compost facilities. Self unloading trucks contain about 80 cubic yards or about eight to 10 tons of dry biochar. Jars are often delivered to compost facilities where they're mixed with organics and composted before delivery as soil enhancements. Some biochars are sized for specific uses, as you, as you can see in this table from Biochar Now. They offer chip sized char for direct placement, biofilters, and as microbial carriers, medium sizes for top dressing or compo composites smaller mess sizes for irrigation systems, and powders for water spray suspensions and injection. Properly sized biochars can be used as natural substitutes for processed minerals like vermiculite, which is imported from China and processed with natural gas. This forest tree nursery uses biochar from a gasifier that heats their greenhouses. Biochar markets continue to grow in North America, creating new opportunities to convert wood and agricultural residues to sustainable carbon while restoring so soil health and improving water quality. Urban landscaping, including gardens, turf and trees have been the initial high value markets for biochars. Use in agriculture is increasing as growers find ways to use high cost biochars strategically in crop production. New products and management techniques are being developed. Products include biochars, biochars with compost, co-composted biochar with manures and green waste, biochar based fertilizers, biotic soil amendments, granulated and liquid products, and micro and nanocarbons. Environmental markets include the use of biochars to sorb pollutants. Biochars combined with organic amendments and nutrients are used to reclaim mine land and remediate oil fields. Biochars are used to filter water and reduce organic pollutants. Forest applications include forest management, growing media for reforestation, range management, and revegetation. Non-soil carbon products and markets are emerging as feed, building products, and other advanced carbon products. Biochar-based products are useful amendments for landscape, trees, turf, and gardens. Suppliers are learning to provide biochars of consistent qualities to soil blenders and formulators, especially for use in horticulture. Liquid forms of biochars help offset acid toxicity from over-fertilization, shown in the cross-lot no-till example on the left. There are examples of this in practice in Eastern Washington. Biotic soil amendments, which combine biochars with fertilizers, minerals, and microorganisms, help kickstart growth for turf applications, like the Lesco Carbon Pro product, which is supplied in liquid or granulated form and was introduced at the uh, U.S. Golf Course Superintendents Association meeting last year. Chinese fertilizer companies make granulated biochar-based fertilizers from crop residues. 62 companies are part of a national alliance of biochar science and technology innovation, which also publishes an international biochar journal. Their goal is to produce 3 million tons of biochar-based fertilizer to reduce air, water, and soil pollution, sequester carbon, and improve soil health. They now produce 500,000 tons of granulated biochar-based fertilizers each year. In its simplest form, biochars can be combined with manures to improve soil health and productivity. Smallholders in Kenya, where soil carbon is very low, are saying that biochar is a farmer's best friend. Sister Miriam Paulette is training hundreds of smallholders in Malawi and Kenya to make biochar in smokeless flame cap pit kilns. The pit can be made with local tools. It's covered with metal to quench the char. Biochar is mixed with manure at planting. In July, Kenya trainer Everline showed off her bumper crop of sorghum. Her corn crop with commercial fertilizer was poor, but she grew so much corn by using biochar and manure that her storage bins overflowed. You should detect a theme here of using biochar with a source of nutrients like manure and to solve a problem like low soil carbon. Biochar use in compost is now well established with composters adding five to 10% biochar to organics before composting. Biochar reduces odor by capturing ammonia and makes the nitrogen available to plants. The thermophilic or heating phase of composting is important to increase the nutrient capture by the biochar and to improve the biology of the finished compost. Biochar is used to offset the effect of herbicide residues in some composts. 
Biochar has helped soils in California absorb and retain scarce water resources. Biochar-based fertilizers and functionalized biochars should further improve plant nutrient efficiency. Biochar composted with organics increased water retention in this California vineyard. Vineyards have reported other improvements such as vine vigor and increased, increased bricks when using biochar amended compost. Biochars can be made from vineyard prunings in portable flame cap kilns as shown in this workshop for vineyard managers, which was hosted by a local soil and water conservation district. An Indiana cover crop farmer teamed with an equipment developer to experiment with manure biochars and with liquid manure coated wood-based biochars. He's pleased with his first year progress, tweeting that, quote, biochar is a change agent. Farmers who practice conservation and regeneration technique, regenerative techniques have been the most receptive to using biochar. A contractor in Washington has found that adding biochar to organic fertilizer in a no-till drill improves plant response. No-till applications can also include biochar-based fertilizers or liquids. The contractor adds fine biochar to compost tea, which improves foliar applications. We'll hear from him later in this series. The USDA Agricultural Research Service has developed a subsurfer shown on the right for incorporating poultry litter, which would be an effective method to apply biochars, manures, or composted biochars. This Missouri corn and soybean farmer combined sawdust derived biochar with organic fertilizers to increase soil carbon, increase crop yield, and improve quality. His yield and quality increased the first year and has continued through the last five years. He reportedly increased soil carbon from less than 1% to more than 3.5% in five years, which is better than an increase of about a quarter percent per year, which is reported for biological methods alone. In his view, biochar combined with other amendments has helped improve soil health and productivity. Thousands of acres in Africa, Australia, and America have been seeded with biochar seed balls by hand, by slingshot, by fixed wing airplane, and by drone. Formulations for seed balls include seeds, biochar, and essential ingredients for germination. Images here from companies which use biochar in Kenya, South Africa, and Australia. U.S. companies also use biochar in seed balls. Arborists use biochars in their growing media to establish or repair urban trees. We'll hear a presentation on this later in the series. I hope that they will report on a current project combining biochar with biosolids for trees in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Biochars are added to fiber, seed, and fertilizer to improve plant establishment through hydroseeding, as shown in the upper right. Biochars are increasingly used in bioswales and rain gardens to prevent metals such as copper, zinc, and cadmium from entering waterways. City of Minneapolis uses biochar to filter E. coli and stormwater. Biochars are used to reduce chemical oxygen demand in log yard leachates. The benefits and appropriate use of biochars in these applications has been demonstrated in science and practice. Biochars are effective tools, but for demand to grow, more landscape architects and engineers and public agencies must write specifications and approve biochar-based products. These photos are from Stockholm, where biochars are used in structured soils, rain gardens, and bioswales to improve growing conditions and reduce pollutants. Biochars are also used in green roofs and other green infrastructure to reduce heat islands. There is now an international alliance of cities promoting this, which includes Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Boulder, Colorado. This is the project in Stockholm, which has been recognized for a number of reasons, including the way it was implemented in the use of structured soils, primarily stone with the addition of biochar produced locally. With the exception of a bit of compost and mulch on the surface, the entire system relies on one part biochar to three parts stone with fantastic success. Relieving soil compaction to improve tree survival was their primary goal. This denitrification project was done after recent hurricanes in Puerto Rico by the nonprofit Ridge to Reefs organization in Maryland. The project was designed to intercept high nitrogen in the groundwater using a denitrification curtain. Based on monitoring provided by the company, the system is achieving 50 to 60% total nitrogen removal. Oops. So Rich to Reefs used uh, biochar and vegetation to replace this septic system in Puerto Rico. 
This engineered media project was done by the University of Nebraska and the Nebraska Forest Service. The project was used was the project was to construct a green roof using all recycled materials, which involved the use of clean shredded tires and biochar mixed with compost. The depths ranged from four to four inches to a maximum of, of approximately 20 inches. It was constructed in the spring of 2016. Primary results indicate that it has increased water holding capacity by 19%, reduced nitrate by 70%. Reduce phosphorus by 25% and increase total organic carbon by 70%. Should note that several green roofs are using biochar as a media component. New biochar products have been developed for improving the resilience of asphalt, for stabilizing roadbeds and building blocks, and to reduce weight in masonry, providing new ways to sequester carbon. We're also seeing geopolymers made with biochar. New uses in building materials, such as wallboard and cement, increase the potential to sequester carbon with biochar. Biochars in wallboard provide additional cooling and reduce the electromagnetic transmission from house wiring. Biochars improve cement properties and reduce the weight of masonry building materials. These products are still in testing and development. Biochar improves properties of plastic composites for building and decorative uses. At least one company is nearing commercial production. The solar steam generator for water distillation is a novel application of carbon nanotubes in wood. It has an upper layer in black of light absorbing carbon nanotubes, a middle layer in gray of heat insulating glass bubbles, and a bottom layer in brown of water transporting wood. The simple solar still is still in concept development, but illustrates what may lead to commercial application. Biofuel projects are aimed at making renewable jet fuels or other transportation fuels. Some processes consume biochar internally. Others, like the Red Rock Biofuels plant in construction in Oregon on the left, make biochar as a co-product. Some fast pyrolysis processes also make biochar as a co-product. Looking to the future, we need cheap sources of carbon for the green carbon economy. There's a growing demand to replace imported products with local carbons for wastewater treatment. Significant research has been devoted to the development of uh, functionalized biocarbons uh, for use as catalysts and fuel cells and batteries and electro elect electrodes. High-end carbons are being developed as carbon nanotubes, carbon gels, and carbon fibers. To convert biomass to energy, chemicals, and carbon, we need to optimize pyrolysis to recover the energy value in pyrolysis liquids, scale up selective carbonization to recover 100% of the carbon in the biomass, and seek new opportunities for co-processing and co-generation. So how are biochars made? Biochars can be made in limited quantities on site if residues are available, in larger quantities at distributed sites, and even larger quantities at centralized facilities. Biochars, as Debbie described, are made by pyrolysis. Pyrolysis, as shown in this sketch adapted from Wilson Biochar Associates, is the first stage of combustion. As wood is heated, about 80% of the solid is converted to gases and tars. 20% remains as charcoal. It's important to keep the hot charcoal from exposure to oxygen because it burns in direct contact with air. Air is added to burn the tars and gases, which generates heat to make the biochar. Excess heat can be recovered for other uses. Car carbonization is illustrated in this simple flame cap kiln from Japan. Char is at the bottom, covered in pyrolysis gases. The gases and tars burn in a flame cap at the top. Fuel is fed into a metal ring which has slope sides and is sealed from air at the bottom. Dry fuel is lit from the top. As the biomass burns, radiant heat from the burning gases transfers to the fuel below it. Since the charcoal is in a pool of gas and not air, the charcoal accumulates while the rest of the solids convert to gas. Fuel is fed continuously until the whole kiln is full of char. The fire is then suffocated with a lid or a covering of soil or quenched with water. A one cubic yard kiln will produce about a cubic yard or about 250 pounds of biochar at the end of the burn. Time, temperature, and heating rate, as Debbie described, determine the qualities of the biochar. When wood is heated to about 280 degrees centigrade, it's roasted or torrified. Moisture has been evaporated and some of the volatiles have left, but the wood is only partially carbonized with about 90% remaining as fuel. As heat is increased to 450 to 600 degrees centigrade, shown in the green band in this chart, about 65% of the carbon has been converted to charcoal, which has good qualities for soil health, including low volatiles, high surface area, a moderate pH, and increased cation exchange capacity. The flame cap kilns probably heat the char to about 600 centigrade, depending on how they're operated. Hey, Tom. Yeah. 
I'm um, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I guess some folks are having just a little trouble following you because um, I guess you're reading quickly. I don't know if that's affecting the captions. I hid mine, but just letting you know if you could maybe read a little slower. Okay. All right, thanks. Here's a one cubic yard flame cap kiln in operation during training at the site of the, camp, of the campfire in California. An, <clears throat> an improvement to the kiln with reduced emissions is shown at the right. You can find instructions for making these kilns at the Wilson Biochar Associates website. This is a mini excavator fueling a larger flame cap kiln in a restoration project. These engineered kilns can be used on small farms. U.S. Forest Service has been developing a mobile carbonizer called the Charboss in cooperation with Air Burners Inc. The air curtain burner has been in use since the 1990s as a clean alternative to burning slash piles. The char boss is like a flame cap kiln with a fan, which supplies a high velocity curtain of air to efficiently burn the evolving gas. You see no emissions during the demonstration shown here. Biochar is cooled and removed with a conveyor as it is formed. The machine is intended to have a higher carbon recovery than existing mobile carbonizers. The US Biochar Initiative helped field test the prototype shown here in operation. Scale up to larger capacities will be determined by the commercial partner. Last year, USBI helped demonstrate the 90 cubic yard carbonator by TigerCat, which also removes biochar during operation. It has a similar capacity to Inwoods grinders. It's on tracks and can be used in mobile and stationary settings. Several in operation are used to reduce large volumes of urban wood. And I should point out that these are continuous devices that are fed continuously uh, during combustion carbonization. Larger volumes of biochars can be recovered in distributed and centralized plants through combustion, gasification, or pyrolysis. Biomass boilers are a major source of biochars in the west and the northeast. Biomass boilers, uh, <clears throat> in, bi in boilers, char particles become entrained in combustion gases, as shown in this industrial boiler on the right but char yields are low at about 2% of the incoming fuel. This diagram illustrates how fine part char particles can pass through the boiler to the primary gas cleaning devices, which are high efficiency cyclones. The boiler is on the left and the cyclone is in the middle. While most plants are designed to re-inject and re-burn high carbon fly ash, some plants can recover it for use as biochar. A 30 megawatt plant consumes about 240,000 tons of wood waste per year and can produce about 10 cubic yards of biochar per hour, or about 72,000 cubic yards per year equal to 9,000 tons of biochar. The chars are often post-processed to remove fine ash depending on the market. Small gasifiers and boilers can also generate heat and biochar. The units shown consume five to 600 pounds of fuel per hour, to produce two to four million BTUs heat and 100 to 150 pounds of biochar per hour, or about 500 tons of biochar per year. The biomecon boiler on the left makes biochar, which is used in structured soils for urban trees. This two acre greenhouse converts wood to heat, power, and biochar. As you can see from the upper right, fuel is fed to the greenhouse, uh, delivered to the greenhouse, a self unloading trailer meters the fuel to a gasifier, which converts the fuel to gas and char. Part of the gas is fed to an electric generator. The rest goes to a boiler, which provides heat to the greenhouse. The biochar is retrieved by the fuel supplier who uses it to improve the quality of the compost. I visited this plant in Australia and it's been in operation for about two years. Small centralized systems can produce heat and biochar. This pyrolysis system heats biomass in an auger. A plant like this in Stockholm heats buildings and uses the biochar in urban soils. In, Aust in Austria, the biochars from a system like this are used in animal feed as well as in soil. A system in California converts biosolids from wastewater treatment to biochar. This array of batch kilns pyrolyzes shredded logs, a slash, and logs. The biochar produced is sized and graded for a variety of uses. Modular pyrolysis systems and shipping containers can produce up to about 10 tons of biochar per day or 3000 tons per year. 
They can be supplied complete with integral dryer and sizing equipment. These could be sited at decentralized locations and then dismantled and moved to other locations. They could also be used in a decentralized integrated biomass facility where the off gas could be used to dry grains, firewood, or other products. One of these will be installed in the Mid-Atlantic States uh, next spring. This Austra Australian gasifier is modeled on a multiple hearth kiln traditionally used to make barbecue charcoal, but at a smaller scale. As shown on the right, wet fuel goes through stages of drying, pyrolysis, gaseous combustion, and cooling. Yields are about 20% of the dry fuel. There are several in operation generating heat, biochar, and power. One will be installed in Colorado in 2021. Stationary pyrolysis provides additional process control for value-added products. Centralized facilities, which make biochars and activated carbons, often use rotary kilns where fuel is tumbled inside a rotary rotating tube, which is heated by burning pyrolysis gases. Each kiln, each kiln can consume two to six tons per hour and produce about 45 tons per day, or about 15,000 tons per year. This kiln in China converts crop residues and minerals to biochar-based fertilizers. Mineral modified biochars mimic the man made or anthropogenic terra preta soils that we saw in the Amazons. Minerals like magnetite or expanding clays like bentonite are added to wood during carbonization. The intermediate biochar is then baked at lower temperatures with additional minerals like those in animal manures. The results are mineral modified biochars. These biochar based fertilizers improve soil properties, which result in greater plant nutrient content. Animals inoculate, distribute, and mix biochars in soil. Deer, elk, cattle, pigs, chickens, goats, and sheep feed on char, which improves health and decrease, increases egg, milk, and meat production. Enriched biochar is passed out in the dung. Dung beetles mix and inoculate biochars into soil, improving forage quality and production. Worms ingest biochar to form inoculated micro and nanoparticles of char and iron, which improve the use of nutrients like phosphorus. The biochar community is composed of many different sectors from farmers to research laboratories. Each adds value to biochars from their primary conversion to distribution, sale, and use. Our survey suggests there are about 155 biochar suppliers in the US and Canada with the capacity to produce about 100,000 tons of biochar per year. There are more producers in the west and southeast and fewer producers in the east, but the map is changing as more people adopt biochar. USBI collaborates with commercial laboratories to determine which methods of analysis are, are appropriate for various uses. The baseline of the methods designated by the International Biochar Initiative to ensure safe, stable, and sustainable biochars for soil health and carbon sequestration. Other protocols exist in Europe and Australia. USBI is working with IBI to develop new protocols to allow access to international carbon markets. A USBI report describes the labeling requirements for biochars in different states, which are often based on the form definition of biochar by the Association of American Plant Food Control Officials. Organizations like the Organic Materials Review Institute, or OMRI, have definitions and standards for biochar. Incentive programs for using biochar are also under development by the Natural Resource Conservation Service and state soil health programs. Our USBI board is composed of talented and diverse volunteers. Heather Nobert from the, the, the Nebraska Department of Forestry promotes research and extension for using biochar in feed, manure management, and soil health. Ron Larson, a retired engineer from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, concentrates on carbon policy. Kim Chaffee, a retired mechanical engineer, helps organize and promote USBI events and conferences. Albert Bates is a well-known author, permaculturist, and promoter of biochar. We enjoy the support of two scientists from the USDA Agricultural Research Service, Dr. Kristen Tripp, a microbiologist in crops and soils at Oregon State University, and Dr. Isabel Lima, a carbon specialist in Louisiana, who is working with biochars from poultry litter and cane residues. Kelpy Wilson is a mechanical engineer who leads our education activities. She's active at, she has actively developed the small scale flame cap kilns and organizes on farm workshops. Kathleen Draper of Finger Lakes Biochar in New York chairs the International Biochar Initiative and organizes webinars, study tours, and workshops. Josiah Hunt has produced and distributed biochars and biochar emitted products in California and Hawaii for more than 10 years. Chuck Hegberg is a civil engineer who specifies biochars in green infrastructure projects. 
USBI is run by volunteers and supported by private donations, sponsors, and grants. Since 2009, USBI has held many conferences, workshops, webinars, demonstrations to try to promote uh, education of biochar. For the coming year, we seek to increase biochar production and use through improved product grading, standard methods of analysis, methods to reduce production costs, and the possible formation of a biochar industry association. We continue to provide technical and marketing support, promote research and demonstration of biochar, and the development of policies which will enable biochar to be used for feed and for carbon sequestration. The International Biochar Initiative launched the biochar movement and it continues to be a strong collaborator providing technical support with research, educational, and policy initiatives. The IBI Board of Directors is led by Kathleen Draper and composed of active representatives from around the world, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. IBI has a first-class science committee with many familiar names in biochar research and development. The European Biochar Industry Consortium was formed in 2019 after many years of active development. Members are some of the most proactive suppliers of biochar conversion systems. Harold Beer is now their executive director. And finally, Australia and New Zealand have a lively biochar community, which has now formed the Australia New Zealand Biochar Industry Group. As you can see, we collaborate with a very active international biochar community. So I hope this presentation has given you an appreciation for the development and use of biochar. I apologize uh, for the many slides and, and rapid delivery. Biochars can be made and used in many ways. I hope that you will just add biochar. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Thanks for a great presentation and, and certainly expanding on a lot of kind of the very basic um, concepts I, I'd introduced and all the great biochar resources available in the US and, and around the world. Um, there are many more questions that have been asked that I also haven't been able to, to get to yet. Um, so if there's anything in particular within the Q&A that you would like to respond to right now, um, you feel like you can answer, please go ahead and, and answer some of those questions and we can kind of continue to just work work down that, that list of questions that have been asked. Okay, yeah, I'll uh, um, kind of maybe, maybe I ought to work from the last ones first and work from the bottom up. How can the supply of biochar feedstock growing scale and scope of biochar uh, be used to, to meet just to be met sustainably, what happens when waste products such as crop residue, down woody debris are insufficient? I think, I guess in my experience in 40 years, uh, we still haven't made a dent on the, uh, the waste available. And if we do, we will have made, I think a substantial contribution to, uh, uh, to sequestering carbon and to improving uh, soil health. Um, so the question always comes up of, is there enough? In the US, the Department of Energy did a billion ton study, decided that there was a billion tons of residues available for conversion to uh, bioenergy and, and, other, um, uh, and, and other uses like biochar and so on. It's, that's really gonna be a balance. And I see a lot of biochar being produced as co-products of uh, energy production. Could you summarize a comparison between agricultural lime and biochar to increase soil pH? That's really for the soil scientists, but I'll tell you that uh, in one experiment we have out in Eastern Washington, uh, biochar over the last eight years has actually had a better liming capacity, more buffering capacity than lime, and hasn't created some of the problems that lime creates uh, in uh, sludge accumulation, if you will, uh, in the soil. Um, do you think there ought to be a third party verified sustainability standard for biochar as to assure that it is broadly sustainably sourced and, and doesn't contain heavy metals? Well, Jeff, if you look at the International Biochar Initiative standards, you'll see the basis or the guidelines for that. Those standards obviously need to be modified over time. Uh, but, but I think the IBI standards provide a good baseline and good guidelines for sustainability. Uh, the challenge is getting uh, those standards or guidelines adopted uh, by various organizations internationally. Uh, let's see. 
Why do you think China is so into biochar, degraded soils, climate issues, productivity, and soil acidification? Yes, all of those. China basically has uh, taken the stance that to reduce open field burning, which creates a tremendous uh, pollution problem for them in all their major cities, including Beijing, and also to improve their uh, degraded soils, 20% of their soils uh, are contaminated. Uh, they approached and developed uh, biochar, and Johannes can, can comment on this, uh, but they developed basically a nationwide uh, system in which they uh, provide the farmer an incentive to um, take the crop residues to a fertilizer plant. They provided an incentive for the fertilizer plant to convert those crop residues into a biochar-based fertilizer. And they again provide an incentive for the farmer to buy the biochar-based fertilizer. And they've had uh, very good results from uh, from those uh, from that experience. So, hence the production of what's estimated to be 500,000 tons of uh, biochar per year. In biochar production, corn byproduct is being used. Does the processing of the husk, etc., eliminate the GMO component? Does it also eliminate the side chemical residues? Um, I would I would guess that it probably does. I can't say exactly, but uh, we did build a plant in uh, in Iowa that uh, that converted GMO um, seed corn to energy for about 15 years, uh, and we did get a complete com uh, destruction at that time. Uh, biochar was not a uh, uh, was not common. Um, but I'd like to go back and, and look at some of that carbon that we actually put in landfills and see how it could be used as biochar. So one would have to see tree, which trees are being used in the project. I'm not seeing anything positive for biochar use for genera such as Quercus. It's most structural substrates have a similar problem with pH and the Swedish project is just such a project. And I think what you need to be aware of is there's actually a lot of work that's being done on Quercuses and oaks. Uh, and I think when you look at the composition of the substrate, what you'll see is that the agronomists working on the projects and the Swedish project was led by their chief biologist for the city of Stockholm, uh, are very careful of pH and the growing conditions of the plants. So again, that's just a reminder that we need to be aware of all aspects of applying uh, biochar. Uh, does Tom come across the work of Walter Jenny regards the use of biochar for soil regeneration and as an important component in tapping water and aiding cooling in the climate level scale? Absolutely would recommend uh, anyone to listen to Walter Jenny and, and look at the climate sponge. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful concept and biochar can, uh, can play a role in that. Is there a possibility to test the pH of biochar producing by myself and not too expensive way? That's it. And that's, I think, for the soil scientists. Um, is there a form to process or utilize the byproduct of the lump, lump charcoal production as biochar? Yes, in fact, a considerable amount of fines from lump biochar are used as, as uh, or lump charcoal are used as biochar. An example is in Brazil, where eucalyptus is grown to make lump charcoal for the uh, steel industry. The fines, what they call moinha, is actually used in the uh, uh, in, in establishing or planting the eucalyptus. There's also quite a lot of fines from lump charcoal in, in Missouri that is uh, being sold and used successfully as biochar. Mina, I can carry on, or you can uh, start with Johannes whenever you like. Um, yeah, I'm just, you have a bit more time if you would like to answer questions. Um, okay. We'll give you about fine. five more minutes. How does that work? <laughs> okay. Well, one thing, one thing we could do is uh, Johannes could transition and give his presentation and we can keep the discussion and answer more questions at the very end. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I had sent uh, Johannes an email updating him saying that um, he'd probably go on around 140. Um you know, if there's any burning questions you want to address right now, Tom, go for it. Okay, um, one and one actually, where are we in the U.S. on livestock applications? Uh, a note of explanation, in 2010, uh, the use of biochar for feed was banned by the Food and Drug Administration uh, because of misuse of charcoal in feed. 
And uh, that is now, uh, there's uh, testing and development going on by Andrea Watson at uh, University of uh, Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, she's in about her third or fourth year of testing. She's working very closely with the Food and Drug Administration. So we hope eventually that, that uh, uh, biochar will be approved in the US. It's the only country where biochar is not approved for use as feed. Uh, two products are approved in California as feed. So we hope that uh, this can uh, uh, demonstrate that biochars can be made as feed products and used very successfully. The uses of feed uh, in Africa have primarily and other places have primarily uh, benefited smallholders by reducing disease. Uh, so in one case, for example, uh, in Malawi, a milk production doubled and it doubled probably not because of the biochar and the efficiency of the biochar, but it doubled probably because of disease reduction. In an Australian dairy, milk production increased an average of one and a half kilograms per day per cow. Uh, and that was due to the increased efficiency of metabolizing the, uh, the feed. Uh, let's see, does the UK have their version of the USBI? Uh, UK had a British biochar group and uh, don't know exactly where they are on that. Uh, is the eucalyptus farming not an example of unsustainable biochar production? I think that, uh, again, Johannes may know something about that, but I think that the uh, net carbon production of eucalyptus plantations in, um, in Brazil is positive, uh, but I don't know that. Uh, I've read that it's preferable to use wood without bark as feedstock. If true, why? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, wood is denser, uh, and so you wind up with, with more uh, biochar. Biochar is a lower density, has higher nutrients, uh, makes perfectly good uh, biochar, but it's just simply a, a lighter, less dense uh, biochar. What's the main barrier to implement pyrolysis at wastewater treatment plants in the US? Uh, we have a few wastewater treatment plants, or I think three of them that are making biochar. Two of them are making biochar and one is uh, uh, in, in construction and a third, or fourth one is in development. Uh, and the issue really is the feedstock. If you use uh, residential biosolids, you find they have very low metals contents. Uh, residential biosolids are used uh, routinely as agricultural soil amendments uh, and it's no different with, with biochar. Uh, but where you have industrial um, solids from wastewater treatment, you'll find higher levels of metals. And uh, uh, then you have to watch what the ultimate product has and whether those metals are tied up uh, efficiently or not. Uh, replacing combustion and cook stoves, the pyrolysis units. Um, Yes, cook stoves certainly can be used to, uh, to make biochar. In fact, I uh, discussed a, a possibility of using cook stoves in Rwanda yesterday. Um, and uh, they do make small quantities, but you, as you saw in the example from uh, Kenya uh, and, uh, and Malawi, small quantities can be used very effectively when used strategically in combination with manure. All right. Are you any more questions, Tom? You would you're dying to answer here. <laughs> <laughs> if not, yeah, I think um yeah, just, we, just we can continue to answer questions at the end. Um and Johannes can be a part of that conversation as well. Okay, well, just Tom, a quick I, I noticed just, that you yeah, were just answering a, as you were going along as well. You were typing in some answers, and I think that's very helpful too, you know, if you wanted to continue doing that as well. Okay, there is a question. I just want to point out that uh, about the use of, uh, of biochar for filtration for dyes and, and wastewater, and there's been a large amount of research in that regard. And uh, so that's something we can certainly follow up with. Go ahead, Mina. Great. Thank, thank you thank, so thank much, you Tom. Much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And you guys can, anyone can keep asking uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, and Tom and myself will continue to, to answer those and, and Mina as well as they come in. Um, but I'd like to introduce our third and final speaker um, for today's webinar. Um, it's Johannes Lehman. Um, 
professor from Cornell University. So thank you, Johannes, for, for being here and speaking today. Um, so you can share your screen and should be good. Thank you very much, Abby and Mina, for organizing this exciting uh, seminar and webinar series. Um, and uh, really enjoyed listening in on, on uh, Tom's presentation about uh, uh, the, the updates of what's happening uh, around the US and around the world. Um, it's, uh, it's so much that it's great that some, somebody is uh, keeping track of all of this. Um, I would like to spin a little bit of a story around biochar and climate change and make a point that um, there are two aspects that we need to consider. One is the carbon dioxide removal, so the active removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, as well as the emission reductions uh, by the full life cycle of a biochar system. I um, want to start um, as I do very often with an initial motivation for biochar because um, it, and I will bring this uh, at the end together again, because I feel uh, this is not only emblematic for, um, for uh, the, the motiva initial motivation for looking into biochar, but also for uh, the system to work also in, in connection with climate change mitigation and uh, carbon dioxide removal. Um, that biochar in soils appears to have beneficial effects on, um, on soil health functions and uh, um, uh, crop yield increases are chiefly among them. Um, that is of course central to a farmer. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, that was the initial motivation looking at these, these soils uh, in the central Amazon that are biochar rich, these terra preta soils uh, and show persistent long-term yield improvement even thousands of years after biochar was added to soil. Uh, so just very quickly uh, what uh, biochar is, um, because I need that for, uh, for um, making the point that it is a quite uh, an important con uh, conversion that is happening while making biochar. Um, when we make biochar from biomass, we're heating it, we're um, devolatilizing uh, uh, um, uh, the material, and then we are condensing the material by driving off hydrogen and oxygen uh, to foster these carbon-carbon linkages. Um, these are not very ordered. Uh, as you can see here from the images, these are uh, quite amorphous, as they're called, or then getting a little bit more ordered as tobostratic carbon. But uh, important is that they're losing hydrogen and oxygen and form this carbon-carbon bonds. Um, Biochar production uh, a product uh, is, is not a new uh, product. Even um, uh, we, we have uh, traces of it from over 150 years ago in the scientific literature. Um, but, uh, um, but historic accounts are much older still. Um, and uh, here an advertisement from the United States uh, from the 30s that advertises at the, that time under the name charcoal, uh, using charcoal as a soil amendment, uh, in this case to make the ball bounce very well. Um, so uh, clearly um, biochar or charcoal as a product for soil amendment has been around for quite some time. Um, in the earth history, biochar has also been around for quite some time. And that is of course, an important consideration when we think about putting uh, a lot of biochar into our world soils to mitigate climate change and withdrawing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, does that introduce an alien substance? And the answer is no. Um, we have um, pyrogenic carbon from, uh, from forest and savanna fires everywhere in almost all soils worldwide, even in high latitudes in the tundra, um, definitely in all the savannas uh, that, that have experienced fires um, for, throughout the Earth's history. Uh, in some regions, we have more than 50%, especially in in the Midwest, in the US, we have more than 50% of the carbon uh, in the soil 
constitutes biochar type carbon. So adding biochar is rather manipulating the already existing carbon cycles than introducing an alien substance. Um, but biochar is not really, shouldn't be perceived as a product um, and as a material only, but especially uh, also as a system. And that is really important because there are many moving parts in that system. Um, obviously the, the variety of biomass types that could be utilized for thermochemical conversion and pyrolysis um, will generate different upstreams opportunities and constraints and trade-offs um, that I will go into. Uh, the gaseous and liquid uh, product range is, is vast depending on what, uh, what kind of pyrolysis and or thermochemical uh, conversion one, one prioritizes and how one runs it. Uh, uh, one can generate um, many different energy carriers from bio oils, hydrogen, uh, methane, butanol, ethanol, uh, but also other products uh, in the packaging and bioplastics industry, food flavoring and materials. Um, and uh, and, and um, uh, I have come into this because I was interested in the solid product called biochar um, that we would add to soil uh, and, and that generates uh, several downstream effects in the soil ecosystem uh, and in an agricultural and environmental management system. Uh, but, and, and I'll, I'll make that point later on again, there is of course also other uses of biochar that are not soil related. I won't go into those uh, today, but I know later in the webinar, there are others, especially my colleague, Professor Gillian Goldfarb from Cornell University, who is very interested in, in non-soil uses of, of, of the solids, as well as the liquids and gaseous components. Um, so let's dive into this. Um, this is uh, getting uh, a bit um, complex. Um, um, we need to look at, at the various different emissions that are generated uh, in such a biochar system, as well as those that are uh, reduced. Um, when we look at, at the natural carbon cycles, um, as much carbon as uh, is fixed by photosynthesis uh, is mineralized or respired by the plants um, in more or less an annual time scale. Uh, if we introduce, introduce pyrolysis into such a system, um, we are converting about 50% of the plant matter um, in, in, a, um, uh, in a thermochemical conversion to uh, biochar uh, and the other 50% uh, to uh, gaseous and liquid components that in many cases could be um, uh, transformed into energy that could offset fossil fuels, um, but also offset fossil fuels through the production of other uh, bioproducts. Um, energy is of course not always uh, being created or cannot always be created and utilized where biochar is produced. So that is one consideration. Uh, and uh, one can um, run thermochemical conversions in, in very different modes, as I um, mentioned already a few minutes ago. And that can tilt these um, uh, the, the ratios of the different products in in uh, in many different ways. And I'll I'll make that point in, in part of um, a trade off between energy and and carbon sequestration in a minute as well. Um, so we have we have uh, this fossil fuel offset um, through uh, that's shown here as A. Um, those are the the first entry point. Uh, B being um, the carbon dioxide removal, the actual biochar being added to soil and the emission reductions because we're now um, not mineralizing that, that carbon and that nitrogen. So, uh, and it's not only CO2, but uh, the two more, even more potent greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide and methane are virtually um, uh, uh, suppressed as well uh, by the conversion of biomass to biochar. Uh, but then num uh, letter C is, is really the, uh, a, a very interesting one because that one tilts uh, the scale to one side or the other, which is 
um, the non-biochar effects um, uh, of, on the ecosystem, uh, such as emissions of nitrous oxide, methane, and CO2 from the soil, so not from the biochar itself, but as an effect of the biochar uh, from the soil, um, and uh, any photosynthesis that is increasing or decreasing uh, due to the additions of biochar to soil, um, as, for instance, also yield increases. Uh, so those, those are quite a few moving parts in, in such a biochar system that one would need to look at. So let's, let's look at, at a few of those. The first and, and, and linchpin and original incentive is, is uh, no doubt the transformation of biomass into biochar and its uh, effect on the persistence of that um, carbon uh, in the original uh, unparalyzed biomass. Um, if we pyrolyze, as I showed you before, uh, we are condensing carbon, we are making these polar aromatic rings, that's these carbon-carbon structures, um, and, uh, and with higher temperature we're making more of that, bigger clusters um, of, of these carbon-carbon uh, linkages, and, um, and with increasing cluster size uh, mineralization by microorganisms in a soil environment, uh, is decreasing dramatically. And you see here now about 10 to 100 times lower mineralization um, when pyrolyzing organic matter to 350 or 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, so these are orders of magnitudes lower mineralization after pyrolysis of a biomass. Some biomass is in its original form mineralizing very quickly um, uh, and will also um, mineralize more quickly in pyrolyzed um, form than other materials. So the range of, of mineralization in unpyrolyzed and pyrolyzed form is large, uh, but the difference between um, uh, before pyrolysis and after pyrolysis is, is roughly uh, one to two orders of magnitude as, as shown here. Um, that generates uh, um, much longer mean residence time. Mean residence time doesn't mean um, it, it is not mineralizing. It means uh, half of um, the material uh, uh, or um, the, the, um, the average uh, residence time uh, of the material uh, is here shown between 500 um, and over a thousand years. Uh, depending on what's shown here on the x-axis, the hydrogen to organic carbon ratio. And that hydrogen to organic carbon ratio uh, it, it relates directly to this molecular condensation. Um, so with higher temperature, we have a lower hydrogen to carbon ratio, more hydrogen, more oxygen is volatilized, carbons um, uh, condense together, and, and that means we have a lower um, mineralization and uh, higher mean resonance time. Um, that has um, found in, an, in a, a more uh, easily monitored version entry into the latest IPCC guidelines for national greenhouse gas account accounting in late 2019. Um, the UN um, FCCC, though the, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, has approved the new uh, National Greenhouse Gas Accounting Guidelines. And in that there's for the first time now uh, a method on biochar um, that uses pyrolysis temperature uh, as a, a rapid uh, diagnostic uh, criterion for the fraction of carbon remaining after 100 years. And you see here um, uh, on, on the graph um, uh, that um, um, biochar pyrolyzed at 400 degrees uh, is uh, in, in this method assumed to be still present, 65% um, uh, uh, of that be present after 100 years. Uh, biochar pyrolyzed around 500 to 600 degree, 80% uh, is assumed to be present after 100 years, and 89% is uh, assumed to be present after 100 years when pyrolyzed above 600 degrees. Um, this also means uh, that there's an opportunity for monitoring practice. So the conversion of biomass to biochar is monitored, not its um, 
its uh, a presence after a certain time in the soil. And that is very important. Um, that gets around the issues of, um, of having to prove presence after a certain time, uh, but can focus on the conversion um, at a centralized facility. But the um, conversion of biomass into biochar and its persistence as verified either by H to C org ratio or estimated by the pyrolysis temperature is not the only um, uh, uh, way that we need to look at the life cycle emissions and emission reductions of a biochar system. I, I mentioned before that it's really important to consider this not as a material, but as a system. Uh, so there are on this uh, chart with, with different life cycle emissions and emission reductions, uh, emissions going up, uh, reductions going down. Um, there, there are a number in here uh, that are direct effects or indirect effects uh, that include, of course, transportation, any land use change, uh, albedos, um, avoided emissions, um, and avoided energy use um, and, uh, and crop yields and crop growth, as well as uh, soil carbon changes. They all need to be considered. Um, they are considered in this very simple IPCC method, um, but uh, largely with very conservative assumptions, um, uh, only the, the carbon is considered um, and, uh, and and uh, conservative assumptions on any emission reductions are being made um, that, uh, that are not considered as additional reductions, uh, but only the carbon changes are considered in that methodology. Um, but more modern methods that are being developed and have, have been rolled out in the last few months are starting to consider additional ones um, uh, that, that could be considered in the future and in, in, uh, on, a, on a national scale as well. Um, if, we, if we look at such a systems accounting of the life cycle emissions and emission reductions, here an example from, uh, from poultry litter processing, uh, looking at um, different conversions um, and different uh, um, uh, uses, uh, including anaerobic digestion and, and combined heat and power, uh, or potential upgrading to saleable fuels um, and uh, uh, the conversion of, of, um, uh, of biochar into, into a drop-in fertilizer. Um, if we look at, at different conversion methods here shown, slow pyrolysis in the light blue, um, fast pyrolysis, um, uh, then gasification, uh, different hydrothermal conversion, these are uh, lower temperature but pressurized, um, and then uh, supercritical um, uh, gasification uh, in the green here in comparison to land application of the poultry litter. Um, looking at, at uh, human health and, and ecosystem quality, it seems that any of these conversions will improve uh, the eco scores, um, and these are just given as, as relative to land application, these eco scores. Um, for climate change, you'll see here um, that also all of those conversion scenarios in these systems uh, improve uh, climate change um, uh, and, and uh, contribute to climate change mitigation. Uh, some of the pyrolysis more so uh, than the, um, than the uh, hydrothermal conversions. While I'm showing this also, you also is um, because it shows some opportunities for um, lateral, con uh, lateral transport that would not be available if we were dealing still with poultry litter. Uh, here for the state of Georgia in the United States, uh, a map of the entire state um, looking at biochar demand for, um, for its phosphorus content. Uh, and you see in the darker green uh, areas that need more phosphorus uh, in these counties. And you see on the right where poultry litter is produced in that same county. And you see that there's, there's, there's a poor match that most of the poultry litter is, is produced in the north, um, but um, most of the phosphorus needs uh, for the phosphorus in the poultry litter is uh, found in the south. Um, so those mismatches of, of um, demand and uh, and supply uh, are causing environmental and costs and, 
and, uh, and of course, economic costs if we had to ship it. Um, figuring out what the optimization looks like of conversion hubs of a, a pol such poultry litter um, to biochar and potential reforming to uh, liquid transportation fuels, uh, one can come up with, with um, different criteria for that optimization. Here you see uh, on the x-axis uh, the emissions. So this relates to, to uh, green, uh, full life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. More to the left is better emission reduction, so more emission reductions, and the profits. Um, higher profits, of course, are, are essential uh, for this for this to make to be an economic proposition. And you can come up with different optimizations, one that's optimizing um, the uh, emission reductions and one uh, that is optimizing um, profits. Uh, and and one can think about um, no, intermediate um, optimization that that look at at uh, both scenarios. Um, and, and find an, uh, a, a trade-off, an optimum trade-off in the middle that happens to be also the largest net carbon dioxide sequestration um, uh, opportunity. Um, so this, this uh, um, model or this point B, this scenario B um, that, uh, that um, doesn't have the highest profit um, but maximizes greenhouse gas emissions uh, and carbon sequestration um, might be something that one would to go one would go for um, and and look at um, the the distribution what that means for the distribution of conversion hubs within uh, such a such a landscape of uneven distribution of of um, the waste material poultry and and the need for phosphorus in soil um, if we are if we are looking at um, different different feedstocks we immediately recognize uh, that the upstream opportunity costs um, and alternative scenarios are making a huge difference for greenhouse gas emission balances. Uh, here shown greenhouse gases uh, per unit dry feedstock um, uh, for different corn stover, maize stover production system late and early. That just means it has different water contents. Whether we produce biomass um, in a dedicated way, such as here with switchgrass. So this is a biomass crop. This is not a, a crop residue as with maize or yard waste, which is just a waste. So these are sort of um, could be constituting some of the, the endpoints of, of, uh, um, of uh, biomass uh, that is not a waste product. Um, uh, necessarily yard waste is to, to some extent, but, but with low environmental impact. Um, and, and you see that um, the, uh, the emission reduction are highest when we're looking at, at waste uh, conversion, um, and they are lowest if we're looking at dedicated biomass production. Um, to the extent that if we, if we count also indirect land use, which is this yellow part, um, we might even have a net emission creation um, because uh, emissions are generated by converting pristine forests into uh, agricultural land because we are supply, uh, supplanting uh, food production with, with switchgrass. Um, so those are sort of bracketing the, the options um, and sensitize us to, to the opportunities and the trade-offs of such systems. Um, a second point that I want to highlight here, the, this dark blue on the emission reductions, um, that's the, the uh, uh, biochar that persists for the long term. Uh, and you can see that that makes a, a significant part for all these scenarios. Um, the emission reductions generated by converting biomass that mineralizes quickly into biochar that mineralizes very slowly uh, makes up the lion's share in most um, LCAs on the emission reduction. So this is really something that we need to get right. And as I hope uh, I convinced you earlier, uh, that that is um, that looks quite solid in terms of long-term persistence, but also variable. So one needs to, one needs to model this appropriately. Um, in this system, we, we were not looking at uh, emission reductions from increased, um, from increased uh, crop yield and, and plant production. And in such a system, um, the, the uh, emission reductions from pyrolysis and biochar is roughly equivalent uh, to the emission reductions from combusting um, the biomass and generating only uh, fossil fuel offsets. Uh, so it really highlights that, 
that um, uh, crop growth and, and uh, soil greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction generation is, is really essential to tip the balance towards a biochar system. Otherwise, we could just offset fossil fuels um, and, and generate the same emission reductions. However, um, and one point that I will make later is, is that um, uh, no, this might be a also a societal discussion that I want to tee up um, with my last slide later on, but also that not in all situations do we have the opportunity to uh, offset fossil fuels. There are many scenarios such as here with pine bark beetle kill or fire prevention measures in, in California right now. Um, there are limited options to actually generate meaningful um, um, uh, energy carriers uh, in, in the middle of a forest and offset fossil fuels. Uh, so that, that, that of course, uh, will also happen uh, in, depending on the scenario. So with that said, it's really important to think through what the biochar is doing as a soil amendment, because that will tip the balance towards, um, towards the, uh, the greenhouse gas emission balance being favorable for a biochar system as compared to generating uh, fossil fuel offsets only. We can think about biochar as a carbon product where the persistence is very important, where, where its surface area and functional groups, groups is important, where possibly its electron shuttling and fused aromatic ring structures is very important. Um, and, uh, and, and that generates greenhouse gas in, uh, emission reductions, but also just as we know from soil carbon, uh, improved soil health. If there's one measure that you probably would, would put on the table for, um, for uh, uh, as an indicator for soil health, it's probably soil carbon, uh, but also for soil remediation um, and, and other more, more intricate and, and um, um, from, to me very interesting, more novel effects in soil. Um, uh, the carbon product is, is, is really key, uh, but biochar has also a nutrient um, uh, value at it, many of the, the uh, biochar products and, and poultry biochar is, is just one, have large and, and um, highly favorable nutrient uh, availability. Uh, of course, we are also sterilizing material um, and potentially denaturing pollutants, uh, whether it's microplastics or uh, PFAS or, or uh, um, other materials that, that might come uh, or might be interesting in, in some situations. Um, crop yield increases vary globally quite a lot, depending on uh, what the biochar is made from, how it is made and what it is added to in terms of uh, crops and soils. Um, uh, here with this slide, I, I would largely make the point that uh, the, the recent meta-analysis, recent the last seven years or so, all point to a global increase in uh, crop yields by at the moment it, between 11 and 28 percent for for these meta analysis. Um, but you see also that uh, that there are many examples where um, there's much larger uh, crop yield increases observed and much lower. Uh, so those are averages, and and the averages are are in many cases deceiving. Um, uh, we we need to really look at at disaggregating those and understanding what made the crop yields increase that much in this location um, and what made it decrease that much in, in another location with another management. Um, now, and how much of this situation is around in the world uh, and how much of this situation do we need to avoid? Um, so th those, are, those are important uh, insights. Um, one comparison that I particularly like uh, is comparing crop yield increases as done in this meta-analysis. So this is again, meta-analysis is, is a code word for um, looking at all global scientific results and, um, and looking at, at uh, what they tell us in aggregate, uh, that uh, uh, the increase with biochar is alone is typically very low without any other um, uh, nutrient additions. In this case, it's also not, not significant. So just adding biochar in most cases uh, doesn't get you very far. Um, but adding inorganic fertilizer plus biochar is actually the crop yield increase over a fertilizer addition uh, is 
in the same order of magnitude, um, very similar to the original increase um, by the fertilizer additions in the first place. So this means that biochar additions to fertilizer on average for the global data set at present is as efficient as the original fertilizer additions was. Um, so this is this is I think an important uh, an important take home um, to, to think through. Uh, that doesn't mean it does it does it works uh, everywhere, um, and and we need to or we can already draw some lessons from from these global um, these global uh, data sets. Um, uh, and um, but we we know that it, it it is as as effective as the inorganic fertilizer as I just mentioned uh, in. In alkaline soil and, and low pH soil, um, there are some fine points that, that become very clear by now um, that, uh, that um, in alkaline uh, soils, if we add a biochar that has a high pH, as you see here, um, so if the soil pH is above 6.5 and the biochar pH is above nine, uh, we cannot expect a crop yield increase. You see this blue dot is near the the zero line, it's actually a little bit lower, but that's not significant, so no crop yield increase. However, even at uh, soil pHs of above 6.5, uh, if the biochar pH is less than nine, uh, we do get a, a crop yield increase. And it is as, as large um, or not significantly different uh, from biochar triggered uh, crop yield increases in soils that have a pH of less than 6.5. Um, so, very important um, that uh, some of the uh, biochar effects are not just pH effects. There are other effect, effects at play. Um, and definitely um, the, uh, it is not correct to state that biochar only improves soil fertility and crop productivity in acid tropical soil. Um, so I think we are, we're moving past that, that uh, initial Sound bite um, and and are 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 digging uh, into the specific effects that also transcend to high pH uh, soils or or I should say neutral soils uh, above six point five. Um, there are some other effects uh, of biochars that are important to consider with respect to the greenhouse gas emission balance and carbon sequestration, and that is uh, the mineralization of the carbon that's already in the soil. Um, so that's different than a biochar carbon. So this is the carbon that was already in the soil and that might change, uh, um, mineralize faster or slower. Typically, uh, uh, this is called priming, uh, whereby uh, positive priming is an increased mineralization of the carbon that's already in the soil, whereas negative priming is called if that uh, carbon uh, is mineralizing slower. On average, um, for all studies that have been conducted until about a few years ago, um, the mineralization is actually not increasing. So this is not the average response, but the average response is a negative priming uh, by about 4% on average. But there is, of course, a range around there. There are some, uh, some scenarios mineralization increases and, and we need to recognize that. But on average for global assessment and for national scale accounting, we can assume that if anything, mineralization is decreasing. So more carbon is accruing in soil rather than increasing. Another important uh, greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide. Um, that is 300 times more potent uh, in terms of um, radiative forcing than than uh, carbon dioxide. So we need to pay attention uh, to this very closely. Um, and here again, a, a meta-analysis that looks at the change in nitrous oxide emissions compared to um, no biochar additions. Uh, and, uh, and, and you'll see that the average is about a 55, 54% decrease in N2O emissions from soil. Um, some are, there's no difference, but those are typically the high nitrogen containing manures where some of the N2O is actually um, might also come from the manure uh, and, and there's uh, quite a bit of nitrogen added um, rather than, than reduced, but the, the reductions um, uh, are, are still 
uh, significant compared to unparalyzed manure. This is also something that that um, is is uh, uh, never really uh, investigated. So here with with the manure treatments, this the, the zero line is not unparalyzed manure added to the soil, but is no manure paralyzed uh, uh, added to the soil. Uh, which is, of course, you know, somewhere the manure still needs to go somewhere. So it's a little bit of a deceiving, um, a deceiving graphic uh, in this sense. So again, very conservative estimates, um, uh, and and some of these are are misleading controls. Um, the the other moving part uh, is the energy generation or other byproducts, and and uh, pyrolysis and thermochemical conversion are can be considered among the most versatile conversion technologies for biomass uh, that can generate quite a range of different energy carriers. And you can see um, the, the different uh, products here from gaseous products such as methane or, or synthetic gas, which is a mixture um, to all kinds of liquid gases, uh, liquid um, energy carriers to of course um, heat and, and uh, electricity. Um, so this affords um, needs to be considered very closely um, what kind of energy is, is um, generated and what kind of fossil fuel is it supplanting uh, in such a, a life cycle assessment. Um, what is very clear is that there is a trade-off between energy and, um, and biochar. Uh, for uh, 20 um, uh, units, these are gigajoules per ton, uh, 20 units of uh, biomass added into pyrolysis, we're generating about eight uh, units of, of energy carriers. Some of it is lost and needs to be uh, you, um, implemented for running the pyrolysis system. And about the other uh, eight is, is uh, buried, uh, the other eight units of energy are buried in, in biochar uh, in the soil. So we are withdrawing energy uh, from such a system. So that means we can either produce more energy and less biochar or vice versa. So that is that is important to, to um, uh, recognize. Here you see that in graphic form on the x-axis, uh, the amount of biochar produced, more biochar produced here on this side. And if we produce more biochar, we are reducing our fuel yield. Um, and, and, and the trajectories of this, uh, as you can see from this confusing array of, of, um, of lines, is somewhat different what kind of um, uh, energy product we are generating. And, and uh, th there are fine points in this that are, are important, whether it's fast pyrolysis, slow pyrolysis, uh, whether we're making liquid fuels, fissure tropes, or, or using the gas uh, directly, et cetera. Um, those are important considerations, but in general, there's a, there's a trade-off between the two. Um, if we compare such a, such a systems, um, emission reduction and greenhouse gas, um, uh, emission reduction and carbon sequestration with, with other land-based uh, so-called natural climate solutions, um, we see that there are different drivers and different relationships that I want to uh, highlight in, in these last two slides um, before I close. Um, so when, when we look at, at amendments such as compost or biochar uh, that we're discussing in more detail, we, we need to look at, at a lot of different moving parts here in terms of where the biomass is coming from, uh, what's done under business as usual, what kind of emissions are generated, what the emissions are that are generated at conversion, whether that's composting or, or pyrolysis, and then transportation um, and, and the soil system. Cropland management such as uh, cropping differently, uh, intercropping, agroforestry, different tillage. Um, they're, they're also different moving parts, but they're, they, they are, are largely on-site conversions. There's much less transport uh, of carbon and impact on, uh, on other areas that are not within the project. And wetland restoration um, as another extreme uh, is, is of course uh, bringing us outside the the realm of, of cropland. If we look at, at relationships of, of on the x uh, uh, system greenhouse gas emission reduction, so these are really the full life cycle uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions um, uh, for the globe uh, potential and petagrams of uh, carbon equivalent. So this is not CO2, this is carbon equivalent, uh, but it's the same idea, um, including N2O and, and CH4 in this. Um, we see that um, uh, that the highest one uh, is is biochar 
uh, compared to cropland management and, and restored wetland. Um, if we look at, at carbon, soil carbon accrual, um, uh, that is, is, a, is a carbon dioxide removal, um, they, these strategies are, are roughly the same. Um, but, but it's very clear that um, uh, there are more greenhouse gas emission reductions delivered by a biochar system uh, than, than the soil carbon accrual alone. Um, and as I sh showed you earlier, that's actually only about 50%. Um, so that, that is really important. Restored wetlands might even offset some of these um, uh, carbon accrual benefits by emissions of methane, for example. That's why it's so low on, on greenhouse gas emission reductions. If we look at um, carbon dioxide removal and food production, uh, which is probably the major concern um, uh, uh, everywhere um, and, and a major incentive of why we are interested in, in biochar, um, and, and also a major driver for farmers to engage um, because uh, most farmers are probably interested in, in, uh, in their main business rather than in, in climate mitigation. Um, we see that there are some trade-offs between carbon dioxide removal and, and food production. Um, definitely for, for restoring wetlands, um, we typically take food um, land out of food production uh, for restoring wetlands. Um, but, uh, um, but maybe possibly not completely. There are uh, very smart schemes that um, increase uh, the, the restoration, but uh, still allow uh, food production, agriculture, but uh, agriculture will probably, uh, uh, food production will probably decline somewhat. And the more we are increasing carbon storage, soil carbon accrual, we are probably decreasing food production. Uh, if we want to maximize soil carbon accrual. For cropland management, uh, which are endogenous internal carbon sources, it's probably also in most cases a negative uh, relationship that um, the more we are putting carbon in the soil, we are not uh, uh, eating that carbon or using that carbon for other purposes. Uh, whereas for external sources such as biochar, in most cases, there will be a positive relationship. More biochar added and more carbon sequestered will increase food production because it's not no competition for, um, if, if the carbon is, is taken from another source, uh, it, there's no competition internally. So that, that, is, that is a, a thought to, to be looked at. Um, if we're comparing biochar systems with, with other emission reductions um, schemes such as bioenergy systems, uh, and BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, um, uh, it, it will become immediately clear that, that both bioenergy systems as well as BEX are generating more energy. Uh, I already told you that we are sequestering some of the energy when we're adding biochar to soil. That's inevitable. Um, so there is a trade-off between energy production um, and, uh, and, um, and biochar production. Uh, so we will always produce more energy um, uh, with BEX and, and bioenergy, full bioenergy systems. Um, bioenergy systems can as at maximum claim to be carbon neutral, and most of the time they're not even that, um, whereas BEX uh, thrives to sequester all the CO2 emissions generated uh, during the carbon conversion um, in geological storage. Um, of course, there are potential leakage. Um, so uh, in terms of carbon storage, BEX also wins over uh, biochar systems um, in, in such a view. Um, so we need to recognize that. So, so why would we even talk about biochar systems if we can either, if we can maximize energy and carbon storage with BEX? Um, and, and the eventual leakage is, is one argument, but, but um, um, we, we do know that biochar will mineralize um, so uh, that is not a huge argument. Potentially, um, uh, unexpected um, fast leakage might might be a, a health hazard or, or an environmental hazard. Uh, but the for me, the the, the geopolitical and, and societal conversation that we would need to have uh, once we are deciding that we actually want to um, mitigate climate change with carbon dioxide removal uh, on a global scale is. Um, whether we want to retain as much organic carbon as possible um, in, uh, in our terrestrial and, and uh, um, 
in our terrestrial environments rather than maximizing energy generation. Uh, so that, uh, in, in my view, there's there's a limited opportunity to to uh, um, uh, foster and, and do photosynthesis on the world. In the world, there, there's really uh, no other good engine than plants that make organic carbon out of CO2. Um, and, uh, and, and there might be an argument for uh, prolonging that uh, biomass and that plant carbon in our environment and generating uh, societal benefits as long as possible, uh, rather than maximizing energy generation and then storing it somewhere else. Um, so some take home message messages in my last slide. Um, so there are some synergies between food production and these um, biochar based uh, CDRs, um, but definitely there's a need for local optimization and decision support systems. Um, and uh, this provides, I think, a key incentive for farmers um, that, that have uh, a business, a farmer that is a corn farmer would like to be a corn farmer and not be a carbon farmer. Um, uh, one can be also a carbon farmer and, and that can help, um, but uh, if there's no, no um, added benefit for the main business purpose of a farm, I have a hard time seeing uh, biochar systems or any other soil carbon um, uh, climate systems succeed. Um, we we uh, expect a higher, on a global scale, higher soil carbon and therefore CDR um, uh, uh, for, for climate mitigation than, than just the uh, ex expected from, from life cycle emissions alone. Uh, but there are lots of moving parts. Um, uh, uh, of that, um, so this this uh, is something to to, to think through. Um, uh, but that's of course not germane to biochar systems. Um, and there's a trade-off between energy and biochar CDR. Um, so we, as I mentioned uh, in this last slide uh, before, this is really a, a societal prioritization that we need to do. Um, and of course, I, I talked about soil, um, but there's a lot of other things that, uh, that uh, play a big role. Um, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, focus only on, on soil uh, and have a broader lens, um, but, but this is a, a focus that I can, I can deliver you today. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to, to chat a bit longer and, um, and answer any questions you may have. Great. Thanks so much, Johannes, for the excellent presentation. I think you may have answered some of the questions that are already in the Q&A box, but if you would like to, to open up that box up and, and see um, if there are any questions you would like to answer, and I'm sure others will come in as you are um, talking. Some of them, um, Tom and I have been answering questions throughout, but we left some that also might be better for you to answer, or you might have a better answer for them than we do. Um, so while you're thinking about which question to answer, I do just want to remind folks that, um, remind attendees that slides will be um, available and the recorded presentations will be sent to all attendees at the end of uh, the webinars or the webinar series. Um, so just make sure everyone will be, these will be available for those continuing to ask those questions. Yeah, um, there's one question about uh, albedo. Uh, so the question is, does biochar making the soil darker cause the soil to absorb more energy from the sun and potentially negating some of the carbon removal benefits? Um, uh, yes, that can happen. Um, uh, soils can uh, be darker. They, um, you need quite a bit of biochar to make them darker and have an albedo effect. Um, and that albedo effect will, uh, of course, only um, be there when there are no plants on the soil. Um, and, uh, and the question is whether um, that albedo effect uh, on, on the uh, radiation balance uh, is larger uh, than the greening effect from a greater, um, greater crop growth and transpiration. Uh, and, and, and therefore a cooling. Um, that hasn't been really done uh, on any meaningful scale. Um, the only studies that I remember seeing are studies in the lab looking at you know, putting a lamp on it without a plant. Um, and, and those are important to do, but um, you know, full field scale or watershed scale, full albedo assessment uh, year round 
I have not seen yet. Um, so I, I, I think this is definitely something that one needs to look at. Um, on balance, I'm not sure whether the albedo increases or decreases. As I said, the, there's a greening and transpiration effect um, uh, versus the, 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 the darkening effect when there's no, no plant on it. Um, so that's, that's a very good, good concern uh, to have. Um, I have to read while, while I'm thinking, that's, that's always difficult. Um, most of, as I'm reading just the question, most of the trees we plant in the urban environment originate from forests somewhere um, in the world and their pH preference is acid uh, to neutral, biochar is known to be alkaline. So how do you reconcile it being a good hormone for, prefer, for trees that prefer acid to neutral pH? Uh, yes, I mean, that, that's, that's a, a basic agronomy question. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, a, a farmer would never put lime on a calcareous soil uh, for a plant that doesn't uh, like high pH. Um, so th those are sort of the basic agronomy um, aspects that one has to, has to um, obey. Uh, Biochars can have a pH of seven or six, um, so not all pH uh, biochars have pH of uh, that are alkaline. Um, so one would need to choose if if biochar confers benefits on a soil um, that has neutral pH, and to a plant that um, doesn't like uh, alkaline soil, then one would need to put an acid biochar on this soil. Um, so those are, you know, I, I think most farmers would be very well familiar with this, um, with the, the effect of pH on, on crop productivity. Um, there are many, many crops that don't like alkaline pH, um, and there are many crops that uh, do like neutral or alkaline pH, and obviously one needs to optimize that. Um, The system diagram implies 50% to renewable energy and 50% back to soil, but the heat energy used in pyrolysis is a lot, so not 100%. Um, not quite sure I understand that question, but it goes on to say, also the simple system di systems diagram needs the system boundary expanded so as to incorporate the possible energy loss by unsustainable produced biomass. Changes in land use have climate implications, thus, thus the biomass harvest for bio should be unsustainably could be unsustainably produced yes absolutely um, and, and I, I showed you that um, with with the indirect land use change indirect land use change uh, if it happens and and uh, it, uh, it it needs to be considered um, uh, then that can offset uh, all emission reductions and um, carbon dioxide removal so so that is something that one needs to consider. Um, it's very difficult to look at um, uh, indirect land use change. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, the, uh, no, for instance, if, if we're converting uh, food production um, in, in the US Midwest uh, with switchgrass or, or miscanthus for biochar production, and that food production then would need to happen, for instance, in Malaysia, um, and uh, primary forest is converted, maybe even peatlands, uh, that are very carbon rich, uh, that kind of conversion and emissions generated um, are, are having a long lasting and massive effect. Um, those were used, there are calculators for those, those were used in this calculation that I showed you earlier. So that's sort of the, the maximum, the, the worst case scenario um, that can happen that we, we're converting Malaysian peatlands, a primary forest with peatlands into agriculture because we are converting prime agricultural land in the US. Uh, to make biochar, um, so so those 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 kind of um, uh, considerations have to be there. Um, it's not easy to track that. There are, there are methods around. Uh, there's big debate. Um, there's also a big debate how much that is really an issue. Um, but uh, but we we need to keep uh, uh, definitely an eye on that. Um, another question uh, my, I found during my research work on swine manure biochar. Uh, that there were lots of weeds grew up in complete completion to barley crop, uh, which could be a potential nutrient competitor to the main crop. Um, how do you look at this issue? Additionally, can biochar reduce or be used as herbicides? 
Um, I don't know why your weeds, you had a greater weed, uh, weed prevalence with biochar. Um, I, I, I have literally no idea um, why that, why, why you encountered that issue. Um, very often, some of the the um, uh, um, some of some of the results with with uh, Striga seem to show um, that uh, that some of the infestations went down in in some um, some cases, but uh, there's really very very little little evidence for for either way. Um, So I lost here that question. It moves around for me. Um, which substrates? Hmm, I'll go this. Asking in bus uh, a business owner uh, a business owner standpoint, is there any different preparation for biochar soil amendment biochar for other applications, um, such as bioenergy to be used in plastics, etc. Preparation, one, one can easily um, assume that, that different products will, will require different feedstocks and different conversion technologies. Um, and, and, and it will already require for different soil types and, and different crop types, uh, depending on what, what agronomic constraint one might want to address. Um, uh, if we're Generating plastics, um, well, from from uh, liquid uh, stream or or from gases, um, then we probably need to prioritize those over the over the uh, solids. Um, I've seen others that are interested in in, in making uh, inks or um, Tom mentioned a, a range of other products. Um, uh, so those will all require different um, different conversion. Uh, Prioritization and, and I think uh, Professor Goldfarb tomorrow will will also look at capacitors and uh, energy storage. Um, those, of course, are, are very different requirements for for uh, uh, biochar as a as a soil amendment. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think those those are probably the the most important. If Maybe if you see Great. any others that that you feel I should, um, do you have any firsthand experience using biochar and vermiculture beds? Uh, I don't. Um, we have done some uh, soil fauna experiments, including earthworms, but most co most column bowls, um, and sort of um, avoidance tests, um, and uh, and and all that. That can go either way, depending on the type of biochar. Um, so that's that's also part of the 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 um, assessment portfolio of um, earthworm avoidance tests. Um, there are some colleagues have found that um, that uh, composting is is um, uh, is speeding up in the presence of biochar. So no, I I I don't recall having. Uh, or I don't recall having seen a, a paper that specifically looks at vermic uh, compost versus ordinary compost um, versus no biochar. Um, so that that is not surely a good question. Uh, absolutely interesting uh, question to ask. Great. Well, I think um, there there are always more questions to be to asked and and answered. So I think we're we're just past two thirty. So. We'll, um, I do want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and also thanks to, to Tom for speaking and Johannes. Um, and please, uh, for attendees, the again, the slides and the recorded presentations will be available and shared. Um, and please feel free to follow up um, with us if you do have questions or you're unable to get to your question today. Um, I do also want to encourage everyone to, I'm just trying to share my screen again, um, to join us again on Thursday, where we'll be having the second 
um, webinar in this four part series. And this will dive a lot more into the science behind biochar. And um, like Johanna said, his colleague, um, Dr. Jillian Goldfarb, also with Cornell, she's gonna be talking a lot about um, the characterization of biochar, the analysis is, analyses they do in the lab to identify certain properties of biochar. Um, and also uh, Bernie Del Campo, who um, is the president of Artichar, will talk about some of the advances from an industry perspective in, in biochar applications um, or production and, and uses. And then for people who are interested in manure-based biochars, um, we have a, a um, postdoc research associate from Iowa State who will be talking um, about biochar production for manure-based products. So that will be on Thursday at 5, um, from 5 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please come back if you're interested in learning more about biochar production um, and characterization. So 